Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of September 18th, 2023. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.10 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss the double standard employed by the Anchorage Daily News editorial board when addressing the issue of fairness in different contexts. Second, we explain the hypocrisy inherent in Senator Kathy Geisel's call for new legislation to address poverty and food insecurity when she herself has been a major contributor to both through her push for PFD cuts. And third, with oil prices rising, we discuss how a budget approach used by the legislature last year can be used again this year to prevent a spike in government spending. And now let's join Michael. Let's dive into this, Brad. We got uh, got a lot of interesting topics today and we're gonna start off with a couple of them here. The first two, especially, oh, I have some things to say. I have some <laughs> things to say about the first couple ones, but uh, so we're gonna, we're gonna jump into this first and we're gonna talk about this issue of fairness. Uh, I mean, there seems to be, the uh, ADN editorial board seems to be fixated on this whole idea of fairness and how it may be legal, but is it really fair? And, oh, but we want it, but we don't. And uh, let's let's talk a little bit about that. Start off with uh, number one here on the weekly top three. Well, the ADN had a has an op-ed written by the editorial board, the Binkley family blog, uh, this uh, this past weekend. Uh, and it focuses on the, the Mancho issue, the roads issue uh, up in Fairbanks, the issue that revolves around having all of these uh, uh, mineral trucks or mine trucks uh, on the roads up in Fairbanks. It focuses in on the construction that's being done to some of the bridges to bolster them to accommodate uh, the trucks and asks the question, uh, should Ken Ross, the mine that's gonna be using uh, those roads uh, for their trucks, should Ken Ross be contributing to the costs uh, of, uh, of those fixes in a way that uh, is similar to, at least in the, in the ADN's mind, is similar to uh, what goes on with Red Dog Mine out in the West, where Red Dog pays a fee to pay for, pay off the costs of a road uh, that was built by ADA uh, to accommodate the mine. And the argument that the ADN's making is uh, is that this is similar, this is a similar situation. The state is bolstering roads specifically to deal with these trucks um, and uh, and Ken Ross should be contributing to the costs. Uh, but there's there's a sentence, I, I don't mean to get into that issue. That issue has its whole, its whole, its, its own nest uh, that, uh, that, that, that builds around it. But there's a, there's a paragraph in the middle, two sentences actually, in the middle of this, piece that just whacked me in the face. Here it is. Ken Ross and Contango, the other owner, have been scrupulous in making sure their operation is legal. The problem Alaska faces and the reason why so many interior residents are upset is that there's a gap between what's legal, which they admit Ken Ross and Contango are doing, there's a gap between what's legal and what's fair. In such matters, it's the responsibility of the state to work on behalf of its people to make sure their interests and rights are protected. <laughs> and that sentence just, you know, just leapt out of the page and, and whacked me in the face. 
it's there's a gap between what's legal and what's fair. Well, it's legal, says the Supreme Court, to take a portion of the PFD, to tax a portion of the PFD. But is that fair? I mean, it, it taxes middle and lower income Alaska families hugely more heavily than it taxes uh, the, the top 20%. It's the most regressive tax ever, according to uh, ICER's uh, professor, Matt Berman. It has the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy, according to a 2016 study by ICER that has, that has a baseline that continues to this day. We looked at it a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago on, uh, on our landmine column and the, and the numbers are still, still, support, uh, still, still support that conclusion. So it's, it's legal for the legislature to ignore the statute and to, and to take a portion of the PFD to tax a portion uh, of the PFD to pay for state government. But, but is it fair? Is it in the best interest of Alaska families? It is, is it in the best interest of the Alaska economy? And, and in the case of Kinross, the ADN says, in such matters, it's the responsibility, the responsibility of the state to work on behalf of its people to make sure their interests and rights are protected. This is from the ADM. That's a standard that the, that the, that the Binkley family blog uh, uh, proposes. So I, I, I don't get it. I don't get it, ADN. I don't get how you decide that. I, I haven't looked into it. You know, maybe the Binkley family has some land along the road that's getting impacted by this. But I, I don't get how you how you get concerned about the gap between what's legal and what's fair when you're talking about contribution toward the cost of roads and, and you're not concerned about it. In fact, you want to stick by the law. The law says that the legislature can tax a portion of the PFD. You want to stick by the law when, uh, uh, when it involves uh, something that would adverse, when fairness would, in, would adversely impact your ADN, Binkley family, your pecuniary, your financial interests. Um, and I think it's just, I think it's just, you know, a glaring, stand, a glaring uh, uh, two standards going on here. Uh, one for when, uh, when the when the Binkley family is concerned about something, and another, oh, it's legal. This legislature is doing what it, you know. The right. Supreme Court said the legislature can take it. It's legal. And another standard when uh, when it affects something that uh, that that, uh, that that they don't gain they don't gain from. Right. Well, I mean, I love the fact, again, that last sentence where in such matters, it's the responsibility of the state to work on behalf of its people to make sure their interests and rights are protected. What about their interests and rights in the PFD? I mean, that I mean, they, it was very explicit when it was created that that is Alaskan share of the oil wealth as resource owners. Where is the state looking out for the interests uh, of the people there. I mean, where are they making sure that their rights are protected there? They're not. It is such, uh, I mean, it is a boatload of hypocrisy from the, because this is the same ADN board, by the way, that said, oh yeah, take the PFD because we need that for state services. And, you know, just, it, it, it is what it is. There is such a tremendous amount of, I mean, I don't even know how they can, they're, they're contorting themselves in such loops. I don't even know how they can, you know, uh, walk and chew gum at the same time at this point. Well, I don't think I don't think they think of it in the same way. I, I don't think I think they think, you know, well, it's in our interest, the Binkley family's interest to go ahead and cut the PFD, because that way we don't as a top 20 percent, top 5 percent, top 1 percent family in the state. We don't have to pay taxes. But, you know, we, we have a lot of interest up in Fairbanks and we don't think it's fair, you know, for Kinross to get off the to get off the hook up in uh, for contributing their fair share, their fair share, Kinross's fair share toward the cost of, uh, of construction. Uh, up in Fairbanks. Here's the other thing about it, Michael. There's no statute. There's nothing on the books that says, and and the and the editorial admits it. There's nothing anywhere on the books that says Ken Ross ought to ought to contribute, as long as you as long as you abide by the state highway laws, which Ken Ross is doing, um, and, and and they admit that Ken Ross is doing as long as you abide by the existing state highway laws, you don't have to pay for it. Nothing in the statutes, nothing in the regulations uh, indicate otherwise. With the PFD, there's a statute that the legislature has never gotten, 21 plus 11 plus 1, has never gotten enough support to change uh, in the legislature. So we have a statute on the books that's being ignored. We have policy on the books that's being ignored. 
in the case of the PFD. If you want to talk about fairness, what's the standard of fairness? It ought to be at least the the legislation that's on the books. And yeah. uh, and for the, and for the ADN to you know go out of its way, it's just it's just such a hypocritical sentence in such matters. And maybe maybe that's uh, maybe I should be reading that in matters where it affects the Binkley family. It is the responsibility of the state to work on behalf of its pe- of the Binkley family to make sure their interests and rights are protected. Maybe that's the way I ought to be reading it. But it's it's a hypocritical uh, uh, statement in light of the positions they've taken on the people. Well, yeah, especially. And I love how they downplay, uh, and I know you don't want to get necessarily into the Mancho issue too much, but I love how they downplay the fact that the oil, that the, uh, that the company has said very clearly uh, that they're paying through the, uh, through the gas tax. Right. I mean, that, that's what they're saying. They're funding the highway maintenance through the state's fuel tax. And and the uh, blog just basically poo poos that a little bit. But they neglect the fact that each one of these trucks is traveling 240 miles. And I guarantee you these things are not getting 50 miles to the gallon. You know what I mean? They are burning through some fuel. They're going to be paying multiples of what a normal truck or a normal car would pay on those same roads. So I, I just again, the kind of the whole you know, glancing or, or glazing over what they don't really want to talk about and saying this is an issue of fairness is just, again, so hypocritical of these folks down there who just uh, seem to keep pushing in the same direction. Yeah, it's, uh, I, you know, in the case of the trucks, the the, the Ken Ross argument is, yes, we're paying uh, state sales tax. Well, uh, in, in, in the case of fuel tax, in the case of in the case of the PFD, the top 20% say, well, we're paying, you know, we're paying a portion of that. We're, 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 we're having 0.1% in the case of Natasha, Senator Von Imhoff, we're having 0.1% of our, of our, uh, 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 income taken away. In the case of the middle and lower income Alaska families, it's five to, you know, 20%, 27%, uh, being taken away. But, you know, we're, 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 we're contributing too because 0.1% of our income is being taken away. It's just, it's a double standard. Hey, remember, some animals are more equal than other animals. Just re- remember <laughs> that as we go through this whole Mancho thing. I mean, I've never seen people lose their minds more over something like this. Um, whereas I'm, you know, I guess I'm kind of, a, I don't live there anymore. But even if I did, I can't see myself being so bent out of shape about it because it's economic development and it's, you know, jobs and it's money for the uh, for the interior and everything else. And I just, <clears throat> I think people are almost you know, the idea that they can be outraged is almost a sport these days, right? I mean, it just seems like everybody's got to be outraged about something. And this just seems, I mean, they said this in the article a couple of times that, that uh, Ken Ross and Mancho have gone out of their way to make sure that this is legal in every aspect that they can, when they put this plan together. And I, I don't know, I, I just find it, I just find it interesting that people are so outraged by it. Well, it, it, they are out. They, they appear to be outraged about it. The ADN, the Binkley family, appears to be outraged about it for, for whatever reason, uh, and and so it's the resort to. It's not in the law. <laughs> I mean, the PFD is in the law. Let's 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 face facts. The PFD is still in statute. They can't get it changed. But their argument is, I, I know it's not in the law, but fairness, fairness. We need to you need to bend over backwards. Uh, to uh, to accommodate fairness, so it's uh, <laughs> I guess fairness is whatever whatever the the three people on the ADN board op ed board think it is. Willie in the chat room just said Fairbanks Borough makes a ton off of mining taxes. Fairbanks Borough makes no money off mining taxes. The only money that they would make would be off of any property tax. Uh, or anything like that. They make no, there is no, in fact, if you want to talk about a disparity, we should talk about mineral taxes uh, in this state. The net profit, 3% net profit tax on minerals in this state, non-renewable resource. I mean, I, that's something that's been a bone of contention for me for years, but all we ever get stuck on is, is oil. We never talk about other mineral taxes. 3% net tax on minerals and that net tax oof, you got some sharp penciled accountants i never made a profit i don't understand how does that work today the topic the theme seems to be hypocrisy we were just talking about the adn uh editorial board but now we're moving over to another editorial in the adn this one from kathy geisel um kathy geisel um who uh, just deigns to tell us how she's looking out for the little guy 
uh, while at the same time, oh man, it's just, it's so frustrating. Brad, go ahead. So it, the, the article is, or the opinion is, it's time to fix food aid for Alaskans in need. And it's authored by Senator Kathy Giesel and Representative Genevieve uh, Mina. And the argument basically is, and again, I don't mean to get, this isn't to get into the substance of this argument at this point, maybe at another point we, we get into the, we get into the substance, but the argument basically is that there are issues with SNAP, with the federal SNAP program, the aid to, aid to uh, uh, those in poverty or 130% of poverty in the case of Alaska. Right. What well, used to be uh, called food stamps. This is what used to be called right. food stamps. Now it's called the SNAP right. program. There are problems with SNAP. Now SNAP is federally funded before, before, you know, we get, we get diverted off on, oh, this is a horrible use of state funds. It's not state funds. It's, it's federal funds, but it's administered by the state. Um, and the issue is whether there needs to be uh, some changes uh, to the way in which the state administers it. Other states administer it differently. Giesel and Mina are arguing that uh, that there's a better way to administer it in Alaska. And again, I don't want to, I don't mean to get in the middle of that of that argument right now. But here's <laughs> here's here's the here's that it's like it's like the ADS, it's like the Binkley family blog, right? There's a sentence in here that just slaps you in the face. And here here it is. Here's the two sentences. The state shouldn't punish working Alaskans for becoming more economically independent. Our goal is to address SNAP, the SNAP benefits cliff, cliff and ultimately get Alaskans the tools to get out of poverty and reduce reliance on the program. Our goal is to ultimately get Alas to give Alaskans the tools to get out of poverty. That's what that's what this entire argument turns on. Okay, we want to get Alaskans out of poverty. Now let's go back to an op-ed by Professor Matt Berman from ICER uh, in the ADN uh, a few months ago. Here's, here's his two sentences. Let's be honest, a cut in the PFD is a tax, the most regressive tax ever proposed. A $1,000 cut, and keep in mind, the average cut over the last seven years since PFD cut started has been $1,700 or $1,500 per Alaska resident. Uh, 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 $6,000 per year, $6,000 per year to an Alaska family of four. But as Berman says, a $1,000 cut will push thousands of Alaska families below the poverty line. It will increase homelessness and food insecurity. That's Matt Berman, professor, ICER, knows what he's talking about. Been here since 1981, Yale, Harvard trained uh, economist. And so you, you focus on that for a second. All right, a thousand dollar cut in the PFD will push thousands of families below the poverty line. It will increase homelessness and food insecurity. Now let's go back to, to, to Senator Giesel, Representative Mina's uh, article. Our goal is to ultimately get Alaskans the tools to get out of poverty and reduce reliance on the SNAP, the food security uh, program. So, okay. Great. They 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 focus on getting Alaskans out of poverty and reduce reliance on or reduce food insecurity. But these are two people, Senator Giesel in the Senate, who was a leader in the effort to cut the PF, cut the PFD, and Representative Mina, who was part of the Alaska House Coalition uh, in the House, voted unanimously. The Alaska House Coalition voted unanimously to cut the PFD. So explain this to me. On the one hand, you're saying that you that we have to focus on doing things that get Alaskans, give Alaskans the tools to get out of poverty and reduce food insecurity. We've got a program, an existing program that does that and treats Alaskans across the board fairly um, and gives them a share of the state's wealth to use uh, uh, as they as they deem fit and and cuts in that will push thousands of Alaskans below the poverty line, increase homelessness and food insecurity. The very thing that you, Senator Diesel and Representative Mina, say that you want to avoid, you're voting for the very thing that does that. So, so we, got this, we got this weird cycle going on. We cut the PFD, we push thousands of Alaskans into poverty, we increase food insecurity, and then, oh my God, we got Alaskans in poverty, and we got 
and we got food insecurity. Now we ha- now we have to redirect this federal program to make sure we get them out of poverty and to make well, sure they have they have food security. Hypocrisy, it, hypocrisy is yeah. not it's not enough of a word to 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 label what the hell's going on here. Well, and they're talking about this thing called BBCE broad based category eligibility, where because it's even worse than what you're saying. What they're basically arguing for is to increase the increase the requirements, increase the 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 brackets around this, so that more people can be part of the SNAP pro. We want to increase instead of 130 percent of poverty. We want it to be more. We want it to be based on the needs and all. That. And so basically, they're saying. Please, we voted for this. We put this in. We 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 proposed this bill last year, which would have increased the roles of SNAP. And we should be patted on the back for that because we're trying to get Alaskans out of poverty by putting more people on food stamps. I mean, that's basically the argument of this article. And at the same time, the very same legislature, the very same votes because they're both come. They're both in the budget, right? They're both coming. As part of as part of the budget votes, in the very same vote, they're pushing thousands of Alaskans, thousands of Alaska families into poverty. They're pushing thousands of Alaskans into food insecurity, and then saying, "Oh, we need this government program to get this to get them out of it." I, it just stop! Just stop! Stop legislating! Stop! Stop thinking you you stop creating the problems that you then think you need to that you then think you need to address. Just follow the damn statute. And yeah. and that and and according to Matt Berman, that will in, that will get Alaska families out of poverty, and it will get uh, it will decrease uh, homelessness and food insecurity. Yeah, follow the damn law. Yeah, exactly. Uh, no, I'm a hundred percent. And if you want a snapshot into what these folks are thinking, and the mindset of folks like Kathy Geisel and Genevieve Mima, uh, Mina, there is a line in here that just pretty much lines it all up in the middle of this. It says SNAP doesn't just support people, but acts as a major economic generator, particularly for local businesses in the rural area. The U.S. Department of Ag estimates for every dollar of federal SNAP benefits, it generates one and a half dollars in economic activity. Well, you know what every economist would tell you? That a dollar in the private sector would turn four or five times that much. And it's like, but, but, oh, this is economic activity. This is how we, again, if the, as long as the public, the private or the public sector is doing okay, everybody's doing okay. This is just a snapshot into their mindset. This, this is what's wrong with, and, and you know, the, the evolution of Kathy Giesel since, since the early 2000s, when she ran as a conservative sat in a, in an unrecognized minority in the Senate, because uh, uh, she, she wouldn't go along with the majority, the evolution of Kathy Giesel, since uh, since that beginning to where she is now, it's just I mean, you, you could write a book or a play or uh, a, a musical about it, how 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 far it's gone wrong. This is the epitome of government causing a problem that government then thinks it needs to correct correct because it's caused the problem. Government's causing poverty. Government's causing food insecurity by, you know, Matt says at a thousand dollars, the cuts will punish will push thousands of Alaska families below the poverty line. Well, the average cut over the last seven years has been $1,500. That pushes even more thousands of Alaska families uh, over the poverty line. Government is creating a share of the problem that now Giesel argues government needs to step in and correct. And it's just, we've just massively gone wrong in this system. It's uh, it is totally frustrating. And they do it with a straight face. I mean, that's the worst part is that they just do it with a straight face like, oh, yeah, no, this is totally reasonable. This totally makes sense. I mean, we create the problem and then we fix the problem, which causes more problems, which we then need to fix. I mean, this is the self licking ice cream cone. Right. I mean, it is the, definitely the perpetuation of that same idea where they create and and the same thing with Stedman and everybody taking all the money out of the earnings reserve. And now they've created a crisis and now they need to do this has become a pattern of we create the crisis so then we can offer the solution of what we really wanted to do to begin with. Yeah, exactly right. Keep in mind, now now keep this in mind, keep that Giesel has created the problem. She's used government to create the problem that she now says government needs to intervene to fix. Keep that in mind when we carry over to one other thing. There's another thing 
that I want to mention here. And that is an upcoming seminar sponsored by Alaska Common Ground. The title of it is Bring the Future Back North, the Pros, Cons, and Costs of Returning to a Defined Benefit Retirement System for Alaska's Public Employees. Senator Kathy Giesel and former Representative Chuck Cox will outline a plan more than 10 years in the making that they believe will stop the bleed of Alaska's youth and skilled public sector workforce out of the state, a return to a defined benefit retirement system for Alaska's public employees. Keep in mind, Giesel's the one on the SNAP side that's helped create the problem through PFD cuts. And now she thinks government needs to, government needs to intervene to protect it. She's not stopping at, at SNAP benefits. Now she wants to go back to defined benefits on the state side. So when we when we talk and 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 whose costs? I mean, interestingly, interestingly, the, they will this this says they will discuss the pros, cons, and costs, but it doesn't say they'll discuss who pays those costs. I mean, yeah, it has costs. Sure, it has costs. Yeah, but but I'll look at all these benefits. Who pays the costs? That's not part of the agenda. They don't want to talk about that. It comes more and more out of out of PFD cuts, deeper and deeper right. PFD cuts comes out of the pockets of middle and lower income Alaska families. And what does that do? What does that do, Michael? It pushes more Alaskans below the poverty line. The deeper the PFD cuts, it pushes more Alaskans below the poverty line, increases food security even more, which, you know, increases the need for SNAP benefits. It is one giant circle of her own, of Kathy Giesel's own creation of using government to intervene, to take money, and then, you know, oh, my gosh, all of a sudden we got all these problems over here to use that money and make the problem even worse as it, as it, as it goes on. Yeah, no, I mean, exactly. And you look at you look at the you notice that with every mention of this defined benefits program, there's no fiscal note with any of it. And in fact, there was a lot of talking early on about how this will save the state money or it will be equitable or we'll do this or but no fiscal notes with it because they realize and they've been keeping that on the real down low because they realize that uh, the price tag on this <clears throat> is going to be astronomical astronomical, especially when you look at the fact that you're going to have to backdate this for people who've been in the system since the tier four uh, uh, part was instituted. I mean, it's, uh, it's, 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 it is insane to even consider this at this point. Well, yeah. And it, and, and it necessarily increases costs, right? I mean, the reason we're doing this is because we don't think the market, the, the investment in a, in a, in a buying contribution plan, they don't think the return that the retirees are going to have out of a defined contribution plan is enough to provide for the retirement. So they want to set a state guarantee. That's all the defined benefits plan is. It's a state right. guarantee of a certain return. If you knew, if you, if you had comfort that the returns the individuals were going to get was the same as what you were going to get as the state guaranteed, you wouldn't have a defined benefit plan. You would, you would stick with a defined contribution plan. But, they're, but they know that the defined contribution plan isn't going to provide a high enough return to fund what they want to do with the defined benefit plan. So they're having the state step in and doing guarantee. So, you know, there's a cost to it. Um, you just don't know. You just don't know what the cost is and you don't know who's going to pay that cost. Well, I, we know who's going to pay it in the long run. Yeah, we, we know. They just won't talk about it. I just got an important text. Hold on a second here. What does this say? Uh Back up, back up. Here we go. Uh, Giesel's defined benefit bill has a $1.2 billion fiscal note. <laughs> $1.2 billion more than what we're spending right now. Brad, extrapolate that out for us. What does $1.2 <laughs> billion look like in the next five years, a year? In that, I mean, holy cow. Oof. I mean, Jeez. all, all Alaskans may be in poverty by that point. We all may be advocates of the SNAP program by the time you, you take that out of Alaskans' pockets. We'll all be participating. Out of sure. Alaskans pockets. Yeah, they'll have to make half the state government employees work for the SNAP division just to be able to fill out the applications. It'll be insane. Uh, uh, you know, that's the thing. We it, It's a dependency cycle, Brad. I mean, right? This is what we have in this state. We've created the dependency state, all these programs, all these things. One in eight people are participating in the SNAP program. One third of Alaskans are on Medicaid. I mean, it's just it, it it's creating this dependency state. And that almost has nothing to do with how much money the state has. We're basically just creating all these programs 
to, uh, I mean, I guess indirectly, I guess that's is because they're creating the programs and funding them. But that's the thing. We've created a dependency state where the, everybody should just be dependent on the state for everything. Well, and Michael, we're doing it. We're doing it intentionally. I mean, through PFD cuts, we are intentionally putting Alaskans into poverty. We are intentionally making Alaskans less food, food secure. We are intentionally making Alaskans more dependent on Medicaid to, to have medical services because they don't have enough uh, enough income on their own. The state's doing it through PFD because the state's doing it. And it's not just there that they're doing it a little bit. I mean, PFD cuts have the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy, jobs. They have the largest adverse impact of any of the of any of the measures on jobs. PFD cuts are have the most regressive impact, take the most of any of the alternatives from middle and lower income Alaska families, push thousands of, of lower income Alaska families um, into poverty. I, we know that. And yet, and yet, you know, it, it's just, I mean, the hypocrisy is just huge. To vote for that, to vote for a, for a program that intentionally pushes additional people into poverty, that it, it intentionally pushes additional people into food insecurity, to vote for that and then turn around and say, oh, we need more SNAP benefits. Uh, or we need a better defined benefit plan because, you know, these people aren't getting enough. I, they're not getting enough because you took it away. Let's let's be clear about that. Alaska had a program that increases increases income, increases wealth to middle and lower income, income Alaska families, increases jobs in Alaska. Alaska had a program that did that. The PFD program did that. And you took it away. It's your fault. I mean, don't don't come complaining to me about people in poverty. Don't come complaining to me about about, you know, food insecurity. It's your fault, legislature. You're the ones that did it. Right. No, I mean, if you took if you took uh, uh, even uh, even state employees, if they were getting their full PFD and it was, uh, you know, the two point, you know, husband, wife, two point one kids, you know, whatever. I mean, that's a that you know that's twelve thousand ten thousand dollars a year difference between the two they could do a lot with that in their retirement they could do a excuse me they could do a lot with it we're, i'm we're choked. both getting I'm, worked I'm, up here <laughs> i'm choked up about this i really you know but i mean that's it's a thing. What are they doing with all that money? I mean, they, the people could use it. They could use it for their own retirement. They wouldn't have to talk about defined benefits if everybody was making an extra 10 grand a year per family to, to do something with. But the government wouldn't get credit. Kathy Giesel wouldn't get credit for bailing out, you know, food insecure, poverty families. She wouldn't get the credit for, you know, building whatever the heck the, the new UA athletic center. She wouldn't she wouldn't get the credit. She wants the money to get the credit for being the one that saves the state. Well, you know, what are you doing to get that money? Well, you're just you're, you're hurting people. You're you're making the state worse off in order to in order to build your vision of what of what makes the state better. It's it, 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 it is a government dependency cycle. Huh? Self-aggrandizement. That's really what it comes back to, right? I mean, look at me. Look at what I did. I created the problem. Now I've solved the problem. Aren't I your hero? I, I've created the problem. I've solved the problem. But in solving the problem, I've created a bigger problem. And now I have to go solve the bigger problem, which will create an even bigger problem because you have to cut PFD more to, more to fund it because you're not willing to pay for it yourself, Kathy Giesel. You top 20% family, you're not willing to pay for it yourself. You have to you have to you know take more, create more poverty, create more food insecurity, and then oh gosh, I gotta go save that. It's just it, it yeah. the, the 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 loop that we're in, I, you know, doom loop, I guess is the is the phrase that comes immediately to mind. The weekly top three continues. We're down to the final one, the number three of the weekly top three. And we're going to uh we're gonna jump into it right now. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for sustainable budgets. The spike in oil prices, and this has always been that dichotomy here in Alaska, Brad. You know, when oil prices are low, the the private economy, oh man, we've got cheap energy, we've got cheap gas, we've got cheap heating oil. Things are good. That looks great. Then the state struggles. But on the other hand, when the oil prices spike, oof, man, to fill that heating oil tank or to fill my gas tank to drive back and forth to Anchorage, that gets expensive. Meanwhile, the state's rolling in dough. And to quote Natasha, we have so much money, we don't know what to do with it. That was her quote from the last year she was in the legislature when they had that oil spike. But that's the problem with the state government. Every time they see an oil spike, they're like, yes, more. 
and not realizing that the other side of that coin is coming again. Like they forget that the oil dip is going to happen again. So they just want to spend <clears throat> to what they have right now and forget about what happens in the future. Right. And, and we're going through another oil spike. I mean, people who follow oil prices closely or not even closely know that we're going through another oil spike. We publish a, a daily, uh, six days a week, and we publish the, uh, the what the futures market is telling us about oil prices uh, this morning when I did it, uh, we've got an average uh, oil market, uh, oil futures price of $93 uh, for the year. Uh, if you take the, if you play it on out with the way the futures are currently telling you against a projected revenue of $73 uh, that was in uh, DOR's the spring revenue forecast. So we're $20 above uh, the, the price that was uh, the FY24 price that was projected in the, in the DOR spring revenue forecast. Uh, when you look at FY25, the, the fiscal year that the legislature will be dealing with when they come back into session uh, next year, uh, the futures market tells us right now that the, that the FY25 price is going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of $87 uh, against a prediction, a projection in the DOR spring revenue forecast of $70. So we're $17 above uh, the DOR uh, uh, projection. And those are billions of dollars. The, the difference between 93 and 73 is about a billion four hundred million dollars uh, for FY24, and the difference in uh, uh, between seventy dollars and eighty-seven dollars in FY25 is about a billion dollars um, in additional revenue. Uh, the landmine uh, landfields uh, a column uh, on Sunday said Alaska North Slope crude has been over ninety dollars since September. The last time it was above ninety-six dollars was last November. It was in the 70s and 80s since last January. If it stays in this range or goes up, stays in the $90 range or goes up, by the time session starts in January, there'll be a lot less fiscal plan talk and a lot, lot more let's spend it talk. And that will be exacerbated next year, he says, because it will be an election year. There's one thing that I think we need to keep in mind when we're talking about FY24. I'm going to get to FY25 in a second because I think that's a huge problem. But there's one thing we need to keep in mind about FY24 when we talk about oil prices in FY24. The legislature in the FY24 budget appropriated everything. Uh, they appropriated the, the $73 and they appropriated any additional revenue that would come in as a result of higher uh, oil prices. When you, when you sometimes have heard, and we talked, I think, last week about it on the show, what's the what's the so-called waterfall approach to, to the FY24 budget and the FY24 budget is 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 predicated on breaking even at $68 uh, but as oil prices uh, rise there are various slots that uh, that the additional revenue goes into already appropriated in the FY24 budget there's about a 300 million dollar surplus that's created between $68 and $73 that's been set aside to uh, deal with supplementals or to deal with emergency spending that might come up, come up uh, during the course of the year. If oil rises above $73 up to $83, half of that additional revenue goes to a supplemental PFD, half of that additional revenue goes to the CBR. And if oil rises above $83, regardless of how high it goes above $83, all of that rest, all the rest of that revenue is already appropriated. appropriated to the CBR. Now, the legislature could come in next year and undo all that. I mean, they can always amend their budget uh, in, the, in, the, in the process of the supplemental. They could redo things, and so that's always a danger. But at least as things stand right now, the danger of increased oil prices in, in terms of spike spending isn't, isn't it is mitigated by the way the FY24 budget is, uh, is structured. FY25 is an entirely different thing. FY25, the budget hasn't been set. There's not a waterfall uh, that's been set up for it. There's not a waterfall in statute that would that would require it. And so things are wide open with FY24. If the oil spike continues through, uh, through the remainder of calendar year 24 and into calendar year 25, uh, the remainder of calendar year 23 and into calendar year 24, and is still there when the legislature meets next spring, then they're going to be facing with a lot of a lot of pressures to uh, to handle it, to to deal with that excess money in um, in a calendar or in fiscal year uh, FY25. 
There's something the legislature did this year, though, uh, as it, that, uh, that it just intrigues the heck out of me um, and is something that that, frankly, we should focus on and should pick up on and continue to uh, continue to do in future years. The governor should use it in the budget. The legislature should use it in their budgeting process and the governor should use it to evaluate what the legislature has done at the end of the budgeting process and in deciding on its vetoes. And that is they use the legislature last year when they when they set up the FY 24 budget, they used a base oil price to set up the baseline. They use a base oil price that's very near the 10 year average price. Uh, the 10 year average price of oil would be sixty seven dollars. I think over the 10 years, the legislature used sixty eight dollars, if I recall correctly. Uh, as their baseline uh, uh, budgeting price. So they used, basically they said to set up the budget baseline, we're gonna use something that's very near the 10 year average oil price. That's That should be carried over into FY25. And if you carry it over into FY25, what you're gonna be budgeting with is the, is the same $68 or $67 that you had this past year. It goes up, the 10 year average will work its way up in subsequent years but from one year to the next, from FY24 to FY25, it's about the same. That's a good thing. That That's a very, that's an excellent step that the legislature took in setting up the FY24 budget. And as I say, I think it's something that the governor should carry over. That way, we're not budgeting at $87. We're not budgeting at $90. We're not budgeting at $85. We're not using projections to do the budget. We're doing the 10-year average oil price. Uh, to do the uh, to do the budget buck dollars that we have, you know, that we've seen that we know that exist um, and uh, and setting up the uh, the budget to, to do it in that way. It I, I wrote a column about this la this week's or last week's uh, Friday column in the Alaska landmine is focused on using that 10 year average uh, in the budgeting cycle and has all of the all of the numbers that uh, flow out of that. But I think that's a that's an excellent thing. And it's, and, it's the, and it's the thing that the governor has control of. Uh, there's no statute that says, there's no rule that says that you have to use an oil price projection to right. set your, the governor can step in and say, look, it's much more prudent to use the 10 year average like we did last year. We're gonna use the precedent from last year. We're gonna use that 10 year average and set it up for the legislature to do the same thing, the same thing they did last year and use the 10 year average as the, well, as the and this is the argument that we've had in the Charter of Changes, that we need to change the funding. We need to change the way that we factor the budget. And I've argued that, especially with something that's as volatile as oil, you can only look at that average of past projections. I said five years because that matched the PFD, but a 10-year one is even better because it gives you a larger snapshot. And you should. I mean, we shouldn't do this pie in the sky, Sean Parnell, $115 a barrel oil when oil's sitting at 87 or whatever. I mean, that's the same kind of thing. This just seems like common sense, but nobody has standardized it. It just seems like it comes up every now and then and it doesn't go. You got about 90 seconds. Well, nobody standardized it, but they did it last year. So all the governor has to say and all the legislature has to say is we did it last year. It worked well. It pre prevented us from doing fly up spending at a time of increasing oil prices. We're going to do it again this year and start setting the precedent going forward to uh, to keep that process in place. The governor can do it. There's nothing that prevents him to do it. So one of the first evaluations of the governor is going to be, did you budget prudently by using the 10 year average? Right. What are the chances? Not good. Uh, I mean, they, they might do it. To me, this just, again, it just seems like a no brainer. If you have this volatile income based on oil prices that are, you know, subject to the market's whims, why wouldn't you look at it from a perspective of, you know, a, what's the 10, what have we gotten for the last, you know, however many years? That just seems to make sense. Um, but maybe it's too much sense at this point. And maybe it puts too many uh, guardrails on them to allow them to spend what they want to spend. It has the advantage also in the future to allow us to, to, to stabilize spending during periods when oil prices dive. I mean, the, 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 the key is that you build up reserves when, when you're using the 10-year average and oil prices spike. You use those years to build up reserves, and then you have those reserves in in years in which oil prices dive, and you're spending. You want to keep spending fairly consistent with what you've done in the past, uh, so you don't have to raise taxes, or you don't have to cut PFDs, or you don't have to do 
uh, a variety or, or drastically cut programs, which is what triggered uh, the, the pushback in 2019. You, you want to have that sort of consistency in spending. Any business wants to have that sort of consistency um, in spending. And using the 10-year average allows you to do that. You don't spend it all at once. You know, you're not you're not like a kid in a candy store and say, oh, I got, you know, I got 25 cents in my pocket. Let me go spend all that. Um, at least when I was growing up, it was 25 cents. Maybe probably you're showing your age, it. showing I your age. Um, but but it has I mean, using that average has the has the advantage of building reserves during periods when oil prices are high and having reserves to support spending. Uh, when oil prices are low and allows you to level out. I mean, it's 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 excellent fiscal policy from a, from the standpoint of fiscal policy. The drawback is that, you know, Click Bishop can't spend on all the capital projects he wants to spend on right. when oil prices right. spike. Kathy Giesel can't start all these new programs she wants to start uh, when when oil prices uh, when oil prices spike. It, it deprives the, the legislature who who is lucky enough to be in place when oil prices spike, it deprives them of the ability to spread all the goodies all around. That's the only downside to it. I mean, that's the only downside to using the average. It deprives the legislature that happens to be in place at the time of spreading goodies. But from a from a from a intergenerational standpoint, it's great fiscal policy. I mean, Alaska's oil wealth belongs to all Alaska generations, not just the generation that happens to be in the state at the time that oil prices spike. Yeah. So it no. spreads that wealth by averaging it spreads that wealth through through multiple generations. Again, it's sound fiscal policy. Uh, you know, you you put away for times in times of plenty, you put away for times of lean. And instead, in this place, it's like we eat everything, including the you know, we beat down the you eat the plates and everything else uh, at the feast. And then we're like, we're starving later on. We ate everything when it was uh, when it was a feast. And when it's famine, we look to the people to take more money. Donna mentions that uh, HB. 194. I'm going to have to reload the thing here. Uh, Donna says, I can't show the comment. HB 194 requires a 10 year average oil price for budget reserve. So HB one. So the, so representative Carpenter is trying to address that to say, here it is. Here's the 10 year uh, average oil price. That makes sense. It does make sense. And, and, and here's the key. Here's the key to it. The key is the legislature did it last year. Now, whether they realized, whether all of them realized that was what they were doing, that they were actually using the 10-year average price for the budget, that's probably an open question. But but they did it last year. They did it. We have precedent. We have a situation in which they did it. So it's not like the governor is breaking new ground. It's not like the, legis the subsequent legislature would be breaking new ground. It's simply saying, hey, we came up with a great idea last year. Let's let's continue to roll with it. Um, and if and if Representative Carpenter's bill passes, uh, all the better. Of course, it's a statute, and statutes can be ignored. But all the better to have to to have that down to have that down as policy. There's nothing that prevents. There's no statute now that says thou shalt use projected oil prices as the basis for your budget. And so, right. you know, we're, we're dealing in a, in a situation in which. Uh, the governor can start fresh. I, I will say this. It's going to be one of the criteria that we use to measure whether the gover governor is remaining fiscally responsible, whether the governor is returning to being, whether the governor is trying to return. How do I phrase this? Whether the yeah. governor is tr trying to return to being fiscally <laughs> responsible. It will, if he uses the 10-year average, that's a plus in his corner. If he continues as, he's, as, as he and prior governors have done in prior budgeting, uh, to use uh, to use whatever the spot price is at the moment, then that's a problem. But yeah. but it's it's the opportunity is there by reason of what the legislature did last session. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for sustainable budgets. Uh, yeah, this is a uh, you know this is a problem. But uh, again, we'll be watching to see how the governor reacts and how uh, what the overall look is when it's all said and done. But to me, this just makes sense, and I, I don't know why we're not doing it already. All right, Brad. Well, safe travels. Thank you for coming on board. We look forward to seeing you again next week. And uh, anything new happens in between now and then, make sure to reach out to us and let us know. I will, Michael. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. And I look forward to catching up with you next week. You bet. I appreciate it. Thank you for uh, being part of it today. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets.
Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.